Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Joshua Mack, the Vice President of Marketing at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And I want to welcome you to our program about Ruth ben Giat's new book, Strongmen, from Mussolini to the Present. Tonight, we'll explore authoritarianism and the authoritarian playbook with two of the foremost experts on the subject. Ruth ben Giat is a historian and political commentator on fascism, authoritarian leaders, and propaganda and the threats that these present to democracies around the world. Professor of History and Italian Studies at New York University, she's the author and editor of seven books and many essays and op-eds in media outlets, including CNN, The New Yorker, and The Washington Post. Ben Giat's work provides critical insights into the authoritarian playbook that have made her an expert source for journalists around the globe. Tonight, Ben Giat will be in conversation with Jason Stanley, the Jacob Arowski Professor of Philosophy at Yale University. Stanley is the author of several books, including How Propaganda Works, which won the Prose Award for Philosophy from the Association of American Publishers, and the 2018 title, How Fascism Works, which was called a vital read by The Guardian, was an editor's choice of the New York Times Book Review. He writes about authoritarianism, propaganda, free speech, mass incarceration, and other topics for The New York Times, The Washington Post, the Boston Review, The Guardian, Project Syndicate, and The Chronicle of Higher Education, among other publications. Strong Men from Mussolini to the Present comes out on November 10th and is available for pre-order on Amazon and through the museum's online bookstore. Stanley's book, How Fascism Works, is also available online on our bookstore and on Amazon. If you order them through the museum's bookstore, you'll be helping the museum as well, since we get an affiliate fee from sales. It's a new effort on our part, and we'll be posting a link to the book store in the chat. The program will consist of a conversation and then a moderated QA. You can submit questions throughout the program into the chat and we'll ask them in the last 15 to 20 minutes of the program. This program is being recorded and we will send you a link in a follow-up mail and will also be posted on the museum's website in the coming days. And now to the program, Jason. Thank you. Uh, it's an, Ruth, it's an honor to be in conversation with you. I've learned from your work over the years, your work on propaganda and fascism. You've been a key scholar and a voice uh, both within academia and outside academia on authoritarian movements. And your book is a remarkable and vital contribution. Uh, so thank you for it. Um, I wanna begin. Uh, well, first I'll, I will, I'll sketch briefly um, the structure of the book. It's in three parts. Part one is getting to power. Uh, uh, part two, which I want to focus on here at the beginning, is called Tools of Rule. Uh, part three is called Losing Power, which includes the topic that we should end on, the topic of resistance, which uh, uh, so too few books discuss. But I want to begin with part two, Tools of Rule, uh, because today is the second anniversary of the worst massacre, the worst loss of Jewish life to a murderer on US soil, the Tree of Life uh, massacre two years ago today, uh, which affected all of us as a community uh, and, uh, and Jewish people, Jew, fellow Jewish people all around the world. And uh, the, the murderer uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in the killer there was, was motivated by the Hebrew immigrant aid, the role of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, supposedly in bringing immigrants into the United States. Um, your very first uh, uh, tool uh, chapter in the part two, Tools of Rule, is called A Greater Nation. And it's about nationalism and purity. Um, can you talk about the role of nationalism and purity, the fear of immigrants, the fear of minorities, in strong in strongman rule. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, uh, Joshua and Ari and everyone for hosting this uh, event. I'm I'm really happy to be discussing my book with you. And one of the things I I felt it was time to do. One of the reasons I wrote this book is to go back and look at over a hundred years of authoritarianism that's had very, very different outcomes in different countries at different times and, and see what recurs. And I added this chapter on national greatness, which 
is about not only how rulers um, attract people by saying that only they have the foresight, the wisdom, the divine benediction to make the nation great. Um, but it, there's also a, a strong recurrence of rhetorics of exclusion. So we have a dialogue between inclusion, uh, who gets to be the nation, and exclusion. Um, and so from the start with Mussolini, who well before Hitler came to power in the late 1920s, started talking about, um, he said, are brown and, and yellow people you know, at our doors? Well, yes, they are. What are we gonna do about it? And he sketched out an entire demographic program of white racial rescue. And when you look at his rhetoric, it, it's quite remarkable, the consistencies with things that you find in Orban's Hungary, or Berlusconi's Italy, the fear of disappearing uh, due to demographic decline and due to being overcome by fertile immigrants. So that's an example of how, um, although the outcomes can be very different, um, there's this essential uh, sameness of the impulse to, um, to have programs of national purity that uh, often end in tragedy and also produce uh, exiles. There's a, I make the point in the chapter that there's a parallel nation of exiles who are people who are pushed out in order to survive. They have to, and they form a nation as well. Mm. Now, uh, can you say something about the role of anti-Semitism in these different movements? Not Anti-Semitism doesn't enter into all of these movements, but there seems to be a certain role for a kind of uh, elite enemy uh, other that that has some function as a target of these strong men. Can can you say uh, what that is? Yeah, I mean, Jews have always been a ready target, and and what happens when these individuals get to power is they they tend to to appeal when there's been a lot of social progress, and you see it in Italy and Germany. Uh, you see it in Spain in the early 1930s in, in other eras. And including a more cosmopolitan, a more diverse population, perhaps a lot of uh, emancipation. And so Jews have been very uh, convenient scapegoats um, due to their own di diasporic nation, uh, nature. And we, we have to look with kind of uh, nuance at this because the the, the obvious example is Hitler's Germany. But when we look at fascist Italy, um, although Mussolini was an anti-Semite, he chose for pragmatic reasons to use the Jews as allies. And many Jews were fascists at the beginning. And then in 1938, he turned on them. But when there are attacks against Jews, there's, it's also in the, con in the context of a great xenophobia. So in Pinochet's Chile, um, the time surrounding the coup, there was a, a lot of xenophobia. And if you were, people say, well, if my Spanish was accented, I, you know, I was getting beaten on the bus. And so, so Jews become a ready target. And of course, today we have the attacks on George Soros, who checks all of the boxes uh, of the Jewish stereotypes that are exactly the same as 100 years ago. And so he, this is, again, the propaganda methods uh, are similar, even though the media is very different. And so there's an essential sameness in the way that uh, Jews are targeted. So you talk in, so there's, this allows us to bridge to the next tool, which is propaganda, but st still staying with the greater nation. You talk about the role of national education that these leaders always urge. Do you talk that it's a, you, you, you show that it's a feature uh, from Gaddafi uh, to, uh, uh, to Mussolini to, to attack universities as bastions of leftist indoctrination and replace the education by nationalist education or patriotic education. Uh, uh, can you expand a little bit on, on the, f the function there and the history? The targeting of universities, the... Yeah. Um, authoritarian regimes need propagandists. Um, you know, propaganda can't go on without propagandists and those include intellectual um, communicators. And, and authoritarian regimes also need prestige. 
And so intellectuals get targeted and often they're found inside universities, both uh, as, as people to be uh, scapegoated uh, if because they're free thinkers, they're leftists. And so every regime has gone after universities, uh, has replaced its leadership, um, has changed the curriculum. Um, you know, Orban recently banned gender studies, Pinochet closed uh, faculties of philosophy and social science. So there are this clean, so universities uh, and, and fields of knowledge are suppressed. Some are suppressed and some are um, created. Think about racial science. I always uh, tell my students, uh, what happened if you graduated in 1945 with a degree in racial science? in Italy and Germany, what did you do with it after that, right? So there's the censorship and there's the promotion. Um, so, and the promotion includes a very interesting history of how do you get people to cooperate with you? And there, there's a kind of turning of the screw that happened over time in Italy. And again, fascist Italy is an example that's interesting because things happened more slowly. Um, so you had, and people thought, oh, if I cooperate with this one measure, then they'll leave me alone. When in fact, you dug yourself deeper and deeper into the hole. Um, so I try in the book to, to center uh, national education and talk about it in the context of these very broad kind of cultural political revolutions that these regimes come in um, and they're sweeping revolutions in this sense. Uh, they, some are counter-revolutions. Uh, some like Gaddafi view themselves as revolutions, but they, there's very few areas of society that they leave unchanged. Now, now this, is, this is fascinating because it links to the next chapter, which I want to spend some time on. But you, you say, you, you talk about how strong men always target areas of knowledge in universities that can unmask them. So that, that, that are particularly, so when they, with laser-like focus, focus, uh, uh, target something like gender studies, uh, like Orban and Putin and in Russia and Brazil and bold bo with Bolsonaro, they all talk, a feature of all these strong men is they target gender studies. Um, you also point out that a feature of 21st century authoritarians is they target ch climate change science, because as you say, climate change science will unmask uh, the, uh, the, the, will, they get their profits from people who plunder national resources, to quote strongly. And so they target climate science because they want, that will unmask the source of their, uh, of their support. So when you see these strongmen targeting an area uh, in, in academia, be it climate change or gender studies, it's because that's the area that unmasks their true agenda. That's a real revelation in your account. Uh, and that leads us to the next chapter, because when you look at the, these administrations that, that target uh, gender studies, vote Bolsonaro with gender studies, um, or that target you know, Marxism, because they're, they're promoting, uh, uh, they're, they're funded by billionaires. Uh, um, uh, but gender studies is a, seems to be a universal theme here that these strong men focus on. Uh, and unlike a lot of political science and a lot of work recently on authoritarianism, uh, uh, you have a chapter on why they target gender, gender ideology and gender studies. Orban, of course, made it illegal to teach gender studies in Hungary. Um, so your chapter six in Tools of Rule is called Virility. And there's a reason why it's a central chapter. It's right in between all the other chapters. Virility, machismo, um, the, uh, the, you, you talk about how, you talk about how leaders like Mussolini and Gaddafi had, had you, talk, you begin the book basically, you begin by talking about how Mussolini had a history of sexual assault. Uh, many of the leaders you discuss, they had many, uh, they, 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 uh, they were notorious in this regard. So virility, you put virility center stage in your tools of rule. And that is so refreshing and hark harkens back to the long history of study of, fa study, the study of fascism, like in the authoritarian personality 
Can you talk about the central role of viril virility and, and manlyhood as a, as a tool of rule? Yeah, thank you. Um, I tried to restore the place of bodies because authoritarians, um, and particularly these rulers, so I have, you know, Mussolini and, and Putin and uh, Erdogan, and so 100 years of these rulers, they are, um, I call them at one point hoarders. They are obsessed with possessing as many bodies, as many riches, as many, um, they want to control everything. And virility comes into it because not only do they display their own bodies, they become objects of, uh, you know, their father, they're symbols of fatherhood, but they're also sex symbols. But they also create these systems where they, uh, they have pipelines of goods and female bodies are part of this in order to try to satisfy their bottomless you know, desires. And too much is never enough is a great slogan for all of these men. So virility works, it's very central because it's not just when Putin you know, poses, he, he doesn't do it anymore, but in, you know, let's say 2007, he kept posing with his shirt off and he and Mussolini are the, the the, the people who you know, do this the most, right? They pose with their shirt off and so their bodies become part of their uh, kind of legitimation of their authority. And so I take this seriously. It's easy to laugh at, at, at you know, them stripping their shirts off, but it's deadly serious because virility also twins with other uh, tools of rule. For example, corruption, because uh, at the center of authoritarianism is a kind of ethos of macho lawlessness, that they can get away with crimes that ordinary men cannot because they hold the power. So what I do in the book is I show, I, I have them organized by the twos of rule, as Jason said, and each one goes over a century, but I also try and show how they interrelate. So virility goes with propaganda because this kind of they become a model of manhood, and this is important for their personality cults, but it also helps their corruption. And of course, it also links to their violence, because again, they are able to have the, the cult of male force is fundamental for authoritarianism. And, and even in the resistance chapter, I show how um, when people who want to oppose the leader make use of their own bodies, um, at the center of resistance is bodies masked in a public place who speak back you know, physically to the leader. So I thought this was something that I could contribute um, uh, that, that I felt was lacking from the literature on authoritarianism. Yes, uh, which is, uh, I, I, uh, Timothy Snyder has been emphasizing the bodily nature of resistance as well, and the danger of relying on the internet, Twitter, social media, just to express resistance. Um, I think that comes across powerfully in your resistance chapter. Uh, and the focus on the body in your work throughout these chapters is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, the, the structure of the propaganda. I'm, uh, in my spare time, I, I tend to try to hunt down Put videos of Putin's hockey games, where he scores 10 goals against the former, uh, former All-Stars uh, in, in the Russian uh, hockey league, it's, it's, it's really... Well, and Putin's really, he's the perfect example. He may be more familiar than some of the ones from older times that the, the way the personality cult, there's certain canons to personality cults and it's astounding how little they've changed in a hundred years, even though today they're diffused by, you know, digital media as well as traditional media. And one of the cardinal things is that the strong man must be and every, he must be an every man, right? A man of the people. And so Putin uses a lot of slang. There's a whole Putinisms to uh, slogans for his kind of crude humor. So they're every man, but they're also Superman. That's they a are- little, they, little big man. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They are above everyone and they are above, not, and Putin doesn't do this, but most of them invoke a kind of divine benediction or they are somehow guided by fate, they have destiny. Even Franco uh, was reputed to have a kind of, uh, from his Moroccan troops because he survived um, a stomach wound and he, he was uh, accorded to have this kind of divine benediction by his Moroccan troops. And this became part of his charismatic authority. 
And it gets invoked because uh, there's many assassination attempts against these guys and often they manage to survive, like Hitler survived over 20 assassination attempts. And this feeds then into their superhuman status. So they're every man and they're Superman. And Putin uh, consciously, there's a Putin for every person when he does these calendars every year. And there's you know, Putin lighting a candle in church, Putin straddling a horse, uh, Putin dressed in a shirt, in a, in a, he's being a statesman. And so everyone can have his Putin or her Putin. And, so, and this, is, this is, Mussolini did the same thing. So if we had an American version of this, if we could imagine it, it would be somebody who would be like eating McDonald's, ordinary, uh, like ordinary white guy, uh, you know, trucker, uh, relates to a kind of vision of Amer Americana, uh, fast food eating, uh, a motorcycle riding, but yet might be staggeringly wealthy or something or have achieved something in celebrity status. Um, it, it could indeed be. And, and the person who blazed the trail, and he's quite prominent in my book for this uh, 21st century uh, uh, emanations of this uh, in, elsewhere really? in America is Berlusconi yeah. in Italy, who was a billionaire. He was a soccer owner. Um, he was, he had the biggest personality cult since Mussolini. He was crude, but he was wealthy. So um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very interesting doing these chapters, writing this book, because the fundamental principles, including the leader follower relationship, fundamental to authoritarianism, the, the dynamics don't change much, even though uh, the circumstances, the outcomes change, and the mechanisms, including information uh, technologies by which they are disseminated, change. But uh, there's there's a lot of continuity, which is why we 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 you know talk about this today, and we can look back and uh, look back at Mussolini and look back at Hitler today. That really comes across in your book. I mean, it really comes across with uh, and the, and the, and the the role, the fact. People often say we could never have an American version of this, but uh, but that's because they have the European versions as models. But in your book, when you spell out, say, Berlusconi, Berlusconi or even Mussolini, you make it clear that they're very rooted in their countries, that they're very much a product of their local nations. Uh, and uh, uh, you, uh, so throughout your example, so in, in an American version would be someone who'd be very American and yet you know, this person who's larger than life at the same time. Um, and, and the key is that um, in some ways, um, uh, Mussolini is uh, a better um, example to study for the way authoritarianism works, authoritarianism works today than Hitler. Hitler, for very good reasons, uh, has always been dominant in um, studies of fascism. But Mussolini came to power slowly. He was a, a prime minister of a democracy for three years. And, and then he, even when he was um, a dictator in 1925 and he cracked down very quickly, but it still was over a few years. And so the way that authoritarianism unfolded in Italy is a little bit more like the way it happens today, even though we no longer have uh, except in communist countries and some other places, one party states. So the Mussolini model is, is quite um, relevant and it's going to be different in every country. So it's very important. And, and in many ways, the more you study this, uh, the, the Hitler model was a bit of an aberration. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think just interjecting myself, Hitler becomes relevant in the American context because of the overlap of the racial and the eugenics, then Jim, Jim, the effect of Jim Crow on Hitler. Uh, Hitler mentions the United States and Mein Kampf. The, the racial aspect is so at the core and at the center uh, of National Socialism and the overlap between the Ku Klux Klan and Nazi ideology. But in terms of the strongman playbook, what you do is you zoom out a little bit and you look at you look at at formations that occur in very different contexts and how such a leader might take over uh, even if they're not focusing 
uh, as the United States that did on, as the Ku Klux Klan did on, on racism and white nationalism and white supremacy, or as Hitler did uh, on anti-Semitism. Um, so, so here's a, so, so the tools of rule are a greater nation, propaganda, virility, and, and then you come to corruption. Chapter seven is corruption. Why is, you know, and you say fascinating things. You say that, so, so you, you show quite clearly that all of these strong men leaders have, the, have this record of corruption. And this comes, this is true even of the Nazis. People don't realize how corrupt they were. They were incredibly corrupt. Um, uh, so corruption is at the very center here of, of the tool of rule. They have, these leaders have a history of corrupt business practices and corruption. And then you and then and you say that's linked to and you use that to explain various features of these leaders. Like you talk about how these leaders surround themselves with family members in the ruling house. So they might have their children having being senior advisors or something like that. Because as you say, it protects it protects that you know their their network uh, then shields them. You know their their family members are part of the corruption. Uh, so why is, so how is that a mutually self reinforced why is corruption so central here to the tool of rule? So the corruption uh, touches on um, many things from personality cults, where you end up having the leader who's considered to be pure. Um, people would say, if only Hitler knew what was going on, you know, mm. Uh, that all, everybody's corrupt, and certainly Mussolini, if only Mussolini knew what was going on. And so they remain clean, uh, even as uh, uh, all of the, the lower down people, uh, officials are hated. In the meantime, uh, and there is not as much research as there should be on this for, for the fascist years, you know, the regime is um, a, an organized form of corruption, an organized form of lawlessness. And we've paid huge attention, rightly so, to the way this manifests in violence. Mm. Fascism is violence, right? But we haven't paid as much attention to the other forms, to the forms of corruption. And, and also the way that, um, that rulers make people feel part of the community, I go back to the included and excluded, so Hitler in 1933, and again in 1938, uh, so 1938 when he did the crackdown and the Kristallnacht and uh, you know, was it a, a kind of real advance in persecution, he, had, he passed a law that eradicated debt for many Germans. So in 1933 and 1938, there were debt eradication laws. And this meant that this was like buying Germans off. So they got something from the regime at the very moments when they were being asked to um, look the other way as their you know, Jewish acquaintance or friend uh, was persecuted. And so this is a form of corruption. And what I do in that chapter is I look both at financial corruption of, of the leader uh, and, and Mobutu and Putin are excellent examples of kleptocracy, where the leader becomes like a parasite who sucks all of the economic value from the nation. Now, these days, uh, it's, it used to be Swiss bank accounts, and then the Swiss uh, are, have more transparency. So it's offshore, uh, the offshore architecture now. And so these people who are into national purity and they hate globalists, all of their money is being protected by this global network. So it's total hypocrisy. But the co corruption chapter also looks at how they get people to collaborate with them and what is the structure of governance that supports them. And so here I talk about these cocoons where they, well, they use divide and rule where at the, at the, in their inner circles, they, they have these people who, um, you know, you can't criticize them. You, you have to be a lackey. Um, and you can't be too competent, you can't be too popular. And so they surround themselves with these people who are only gonna tell them the reality they want. So the news they want to hear. And what I show is ultimately this is highly destructive and it leads to very bad decision-making. Um, the fascists in World War II are one example. Um, and so the very things they do to protect their power, including um, having family, 
uh, be part of their kind of um, capture of the economy. And Orban has done this, and Erdogan has done this, and Putin. Or Orban's, Orban's daughter, Orban's son law is a billionaire. Yes, so we have many examples of this, but the, these very things they do end up often coming back to bite them. And in the end, one of the main uh, points I want to make in the book is through their own propaganda and also propaganda of the US uh, uh, PR firms and lobby firms that all of them hire, we have this myth of authoritarianism as uh, you know, constructive and stable and productive governance, law and order, safety, good for business. And what I show is that in fact, um, it's highly destructive, highly chaotic, and leads to a lot of business community being persecuted and having to go into exile. And this has happened in our day with Erdogan. Uh, it's happened uh, with Putin. And in Chile, you had 200,000 Chileans, including business owners who had to go abroad. So yeah. I kind of wanted to tell this stories of corruption uh, to un unseat this myth of the trains running on time. That's shorthand for, oh, you know, Mussolini made the trains run on time, so what could be wrong, right? One of, one of the very <laughs> important things of your book, I felt, was to focus on Pinochet in Chile, Chile, because sometimes when people talk about authoritarianism, uh, mid-century authoritarianism, uh, early to mid-century, 20th century authoritarianism, they focus on state control of the economy in various ways. You clearly show both that that was much more complicated in Italy, that in fact, all sorts of uh, capitalist firms and big business were involved with Mussolini, uh, including US firms like Sinclair Oil. Uh, the link to the oil companies uh, and these leaders goes back far. The connection as you draw, as you show to the, or to the, to plunder to the, uh, uh, but Chile is uh, an important case because it was set up by Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys. And it was a brutal dic dictatorship where leftists were murdered and tortured. Uh, 20, over 20,000 professors were fired as radical leftist professors. Um, you know, the, the radical professors were targeted, so-called radical professors were targeted. Um, uh, so, uh, so you show very clearly that these, these regimes, so they do give, uh, sometimes give things to their supporters, uh, you know, are completely compatible and be symbiotic with, um, with uh, big business. And you emphasize, of course, uh, as we know, that Mussolini, Hitler, this whole history is all about attacks on the labor unions. Uh. Yeah, and the the Pinochet, I really wanted to include that, and 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 basically, those who um, uh, read the book will see that it's designed um, to. I am a historian of fascism, so uh, almost all of them are right wing authoritarians, and there's many studies of right wing authoritarianism. Um, others are in there uh, as they relate to, um, I wanted to show kind of continuities that are not often talked about. So Gaddafi is in there because he connects to Mussolini through the, Libya, through the Italian occupation of Libya that shaped him and to Berlusconi. Pinochet mm. is there uh, as a kind of place together with Franco Spain also there, um, where a lot of um, fasc neo-fascists and neo-Nazis uh, went and the prolongation of this right-wing counter-revolution. Um, you know, when the junta took power in 73, uh, one of the, one of the uh, an air force general who was one of the you know, ruling junta said, uh, we are, today we are eradicating the Marxist cancer. And this is language that you know, is, was not invented there. So I wanted to show where these, where did these things go after fascism uh, was defeated in 1945. So, so I have Pinochet for, for that reason and, and many others. Um, it's also a real cautionary tale because as one uh, country on the continent after another fell to dictatorship with Brazil and Guatemala and other places, the Chileans kept saying it can't happen here. Our military is wedded to the constitution. Our military is apolitical. 
um, we are wedded to democracy. And then uh, it did happen with US help. But I, I also talk about elements within Chilean society that were um, disaffected with democracy under Allende, who was a socialist president. And the internal tensions in Chilean society um, and that I think that's important to do um, because it was Chileans who operated on the ground in the torture rooms, but also in the propaganda offices, uh, Pinochet's counter revolution. And, and it was very sad what happened. Uh, again, 200,000 Chileans left and went into exile. That's an enormous number. Um, and it permanently and what, changed the, the history of the country. One thing I want to say about the book before we conclude the discussion and move to Q&A is that unlike almost any other book on the topic, you repeatedly emphasize, and both of us are Americans, you repeatedly emphasize the U.S. involvement in the promoting of these strongmen. Uh, Chile is an obvious example, but also Italy and, uh, and other examples you, you, you show. And so it's really, uh, if, we're to, if we're to challenge authoritarianism, challenge strongmen, we must also be self-critical. And your book is a remarkable exercise in, in that virtue. Um, now, uh, I wanna conclude on a personal note. Now, you and I have been talking at conferences together and are on a, a team learning from each other over the years, but we have very different personal histories. You spoke of Kostelnok, my father was, was there at age five and was on the streets of Berlin, one of the more horrifying nights of his life. My mother was a, in, in Siberia and Poland. Uh, I come from a Holocaust surviving family, a, a family, family of refugees. You have a very different history that led to this. Uh, how did your history lead you to your remarkable and pathbreaking work on Italian fascism? So I grew up in uh, Pacific Palisades, uh, a, a very idyllic seafront town in California, in Southern California. And my father's from Israel, a Sephardic Jewish family. My grandfather was uh, from Yemen, from Aden. My mother's from Scotland, a Protestant family from Edinburgh. And so um, they immigrated and I grew up in California. And this town and also other towns around it where uh, a lot of anti-famous and less famous exiles from Nazism had resettled. And I used, to, uh, I used to think about what that meant for them to resettle and, 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 and be so far away and have to start over. And in, uh, in high school, I got to know um, the son of Arnold Schoenberg, the composer, uh, Larry Schoenberg. And so he would talk to me about these experiences. And then at UCLA, uh, where I went to undergrad, I took a seminar taught by Robert Wall in exiles in this kind of, there was a book called Weimar on the Pacific. Um, and I was doing a lot of music, I was trained in music. So I did my senior thesis on Otto Klemperer. And I was very captivated by the fact that these people had to leave and they settled in a completely different environment, Southern California, and had to start over. And in Klemperer's case, he was trying to bring modernist music to Southern California in the 1930s as the, as the working for the LA Philharmonic. So I got interested in cultural history that way uh, because my own family, you know, with one from Israel and one from Scotland, there, there was no uh, organic connection to the events of continental Europe. So it was through that. Um, Avenue. And I was going to do German history. I was taking German. And then I went to grad school and uh, decided, uh, somebody suggested that I do Italian history because not that much was done uh, compared to German history. And so that's how it got started. All right. So let, uh, unfortunately, I, well, I think we have a lot of good questions on the chapters we didn't get to, like the transition from democracy uh, to how democracy undermines, how strong men undermine democracy to bring it to authoritarianism. And of course, the crucial chapter, uh, part three about resistance. And I'll turn it over to Joshua to guide us through the questions. Thank you, Ruth, for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, it's, this has been fantastic and it's raised some wonderful questions from the audience that range um, 
historically to the present day. So one question from Michael Livingston concerns ideology. He says that Mussolini, Stalin, and Hitler had reasonably coherent ideologies. Putin, Berlusconi seem to be more ad hoc. Um, does this or does it not make a big difference? Or is it just two sides of the same coin? Um, I think that one thing that all of these personalities have in common or they wouldn't have gotten to where they were is opportunism. Some of them are more, we can say, flexible about um, their strategies. Some of them will revise. One of the reasons Franco lasted for so long is that he was the ultimate chameleon, as one of his biographers calls him. He was fascist during the fascist years, and then he became the best, uh, one of the best early Cold War American clients. Um, and so he did not hesitate to change his uh, strategies. Um, so ideology means different things to, di to different rulers. And in the case of fascism, ambiguity, ideological ambiguity was built into fascism. And Mussolini used to have these slogans like he would say, fascism is a revolution of reaction. Well, what does that mean? Right? But it meant something. It meant that he could attract conservative elites, industrialists. They liked the reaction. And he, he also had former leftists and, and youth and kind of hotheads, and they liked the revolution. So each of them um, the systems, of course, vastly different. I mean, when we talk about St Stalinist communism, it's a far more rigid system in general. And I, I don't include communists in my book. I have post-communists like Putin because I'm looking at people who uh, in the main took over a democracy and damaged it or wrecked it altogether. Um, so, but opportunism is key and uh, being able to change your course in order to, they will do anything to stay in power. Um, no matter what the cost. And, and I think an ideo common ideology does emerge here because throughout uh, Ruth's book is a cult of the leader. They're all about themselves. Each one is focused on themselves. Themselves is the focus of attention. The whole Ruth talks about how all of these leaders like to be in the, in the news all the time, the center of every broadcast, pictures of them everywhere. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a unifying theme of all of these, from the Hitlers and Mussolinis to the uh, to the Gaddafis uh, and uh, and Mobutos, is that it's all about themselves. And uh, narcissism is an ideology. The cult of the leader <laughs> is an ideology. Uh, that that actually that actually leads. Um, Dale earlier, Dale Dorshow asked. Um, said that John Dean's book, Conservatives Without Conscience, points to a profound deficit in empathy in authoritarian conser conservative leaders and wanted to know if there was a developmental influence that solidified this trait um, throughout. Um, I don't know if there's a development. I, I couldn't say if there's a common developmental influence on these people, but what I have learned is you can, they all have a similar personality. Um, a profound lack of, of empathy, of compassion. Many of them are violent. Um, many of them came to power with criminal records. Um, and they're different, they're violent in different ways, but uh, this lawlessness um, is, is very, very important. And also scorn for people. This is one of the saddest things about the authoritarian leader follower relationship is that the people who adulate him will um, do anything, even put their health or their lives at risk. And the leader scorns them. Um, and he truly despises them. And giving up your power to a person like that makes them despise you all the more. This is the secret. Um, so they're, uh, they're, in the introduction to the book, I, I, I look at quotes about certain leaders. And if you know the history of past and present, you will see that all of them qualify for all of the quotes. There is that. Sorry. Quick note on the follower leader relation. I want to give a shout out to Elsa Frankel Brunswick, the uh, Jewish scholar, co author of The Authoritarian Personality. You can look at uh, Ruth's book, studies the personality of the strongman, the narcissistic, self involved, uh, uh, corrupt, uh, violent 
character of the strong men, but there's also a big literature on the followers of the strong men, the one who attends, attend their rallies in worshipful ways and follow their, their, their you know, spend, for, spend hours waiting to get into rallies. And that literature, there's a, Elsa Frankel Brunswick, this Jewish psych, psych, child psychologist, studied the, the character traits of people who were led to desire to follow an authoritarian strongman. Um, and so there's two subjects here. The psychology of the strongman, which is studied from Plato on down to, to Ruth's book, and the psychology of the follower. I guess that um, ties in actually. Someone, Howard Debs asked, why has there seemed to be an ascendance of strongman regimes in recent years? Or maybe that, has, that isn't true, or maybe it's just a sense that we have. And what is causing the success of authoritarianism in this particular global moment? Yes, um, unfortunately we are indeed in the, I, I look, I divide the book into three eras. The first is the fascist era and all the chapters treat this, these three eras through certain people, right? So we have Mussolini, Hitler, the fascists and Franco and then Franco is a tie to the age of military coups Mobuto, Pinochet, Gaddafi, and then I have what we call the new authoritarian age. And there's Erdogan, there's Putin, there's, you know, the, the cast of characters we know. And, um, you know, the remote origins or the fall of communism, which unleashed the conditions for a flowering of the new right. Um, and then you have, you know, characters like Putin and eventually Orban. Um, you also have the recession of 2008. You have, um, you know, kind of a worsening, uh, worsening uh, financial and economic crisis that caused this kind of populism. I don't use the word populism too much in the book, other than uh, for certain certain strong men who use populist ideologies. Not all of them are populists. Mussolini was a populist. A lot of the contemporary people are. Uh, Pinochet was not a populist. Um, so, so, and I think there is a thing of contagion that when we're talking, when we, when we pan out to the international order, um, the more that uh, one has success in disrespecting international agreements, in disrespecting human rights and getting away with things, getting away with things is fundamental. Uh, the more others are empowered to do so. If you think about the extremely the tragic uh, end of Jamal Khashoggi, would that have happened if there were not, you know, so many alliances with Erdogan and 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 Trump and all of these people who who condone the infringement of human rights, condone the attacks on journalists? So it becomes a kind of, I've been calling it since 2016, Axis 2.0. Um, it's it's this new we're in a period of great reshaping of the international order. Think of all the different treaties and alliances that have been are, are unraveling right now and being reconstituted. So we're in the middle of something that we don't know the end of yet. Um, and, and especially in our country, we have an election coming up that, uh, but that has been decisive. Um, uh, what, what one does empowers the other. Thanks. I think um, people are well, it's talking about the elephant in the room, but people that is sort of intentional. Um, so the question is, if you're in a society, I guess, that um, is under threat from authoritarianism, or, or what, what can people do? Um, what, what do people do in these other situations? Do they just burn themselves out and get in there? Like, how do authoritarians end? And what can people, can people actually do anything about it? Um, a lot of the cases in the book, because they are regimes, uh, they, they, talk about, they talk about resistance at all. There's armed resistance. By far the most effective kind of resistance is you know, mass nonviolent protest. You know, many people in the streets consistently. That doesn't work when a regime, and I mean 
a real, you know, a kind of real one party old fashioned state. You can't do that at the peak of the power. You can do that. You can start to do that when it's unraveling at the end. And, and, uh, and we saw that with the fall of communism. And one of the, the very things I found very inspiring writing the resistance chapter is that there, there are these interlinked tactics and moments that go over a century um, that get picked up. Um, for example, uh, there was uh, during the fall of communism, there was this uh, human chain that was formed called the Baltic Way. And then in, in resistance to Berlusconi, there was a movement called the Girotondi where people linked their arms and they encircled monuments uh, like the Department of Justice equivalent or um, the state broadcaster that they felt were imperiled. And more recently in Hong Kong, uh, resistors paid homage to the Baltic way. Again, so these are tactics that, and, and we go back to the body because um, it, resistance can be very effectively waged digitally. And um, today, many of the, um, the key moments that in, in resistance history that get memorialized, like when the secret police knock on your door, Today, because of digital storytelling, we see those sometimes. That's happened in Russia. Um, uh, Sobol, this uh, female resistor against Putin, she filmed when the police were knocking on her door. But years ago, we wouldn't have seen that. We would have heard about it in accounts or memoirs. Um, so, so there's that. And so digital media is a great boon to resistance because it creates these communities of solidarity. But, but in, embodied acts of physical resistance, being together in public places, reclaiming the public space that the leader has colonized with changing the street names, putting up new statues, all the things that leaders do to imprint themselves on the landscape. Physical nonviolent mass resistance is incredibly effective at reclaiming the nation, at reclaiming language. Um, re and, 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 and letting people know that these values of solidarity and compassion and kindness are not dead. And that's, that's very important. I think that that's a great time to end, actually. I mean, thank you. Thank On you. A happy both. note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Action and, and doing something. So um, thank you so much, Ruth and Jason. Um, by her book, by his book. <laughs> and uh, we'll put up a recording of this in the next day or two. Thank you um, so thank much. You and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ruth, for your book and for your presence. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye to everybody. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>